Um, friends, those of you that are here online, I want to admit that I have known Dr. Smith for at least 40 years, if not longer. We were both young. We both had dark gray, dark black hair. <laughs> and over time, <laughs> uh, you're seeing what, what was, has been described as the graying of America reflected in Smitty and I. Even though uh, formally we think of him as Dr. William H. Smith, informally he has always been my big brother, Smitty. And in fact, he has been everybody's big bro brother, Smitty, for forever. Uh, Dr. Smith, uh, the PhD in education, is the founding and executive director of the National Center for Race Amity. He has a background in public education, administration, and communication. He promotes cross-racial, cross-cultural amity as a means of moving America towards E Pluribus Unum. He was a president of Comtel Production Inc., then executive director of the Center for Diversity and Communication Industries at Emerson College. He's the producer slash co-writer of the award-winning documentary, Invisible Soldiers, Unheard Voices. And if I may say, his five-part series on race unity and race amity was broadcast here in Austin and elsewhere, a five-part series on the public radio state, public television station here in Austin. Not sure about if it was broadcast in Houston and elsewhere, but we certainly got to watch it live. And for those of you that are interested, we can get on Dr. Smith's site, Race Amity's site, and acquire those five DVD tapes for sharing with our friends and family. They are wonderful. They're really true. And I encourage all of you that have friends who would be interested in the subject of race unity and race amity to order those. They're not necessarily Baha'i, but definitely draw upon the Baha'i writings. Uh, he's a producer, co-writer of the award-winning documentary, Invisible Soldiers, Unheard Voices. He's the concept creator, co-executive pro producer of the 2018 documentary, An American Story, Race Amity and Other Traditions. He was the principal organizer of the state bill establishing race amity Day in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He co-authored with Dr. Richard Thomas, a book called Race Amity, America's Other Tradition, which was published in 2019. But to me, a football fan, important <laughs> to point out that he was responsible for being one of the first people to integrate NCAA Division I football starting with, what was the university? Uh, Wake Forest. Wake Forest. And, and football has never been the same. In fact, someone football hear me? is fun. It's not. So, so, so thank you for that, for which he, um, he was written up in Time Magazine in 2015 as one of the people that brought about integration in uh, NCAA football. And for that, we are all eternally grateful. Uh, of all the qualifications and things I could tell you about Smitty, the one thing that I think is important for me to say, he's my friend, here's Smitty. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, I am I'm so happy, uh, first, just to be here with all of you uh, and doing something that is really a privilege and a bounty to do. Uh, and that is truly to have the opportunity to share and talk about the Baha'i faith and Baha'u'llah, who is the founder of the Baha'i faith and whose inspiration uh, has guided my life since I was a teenager. And uh, I'm working to 
stay on the path that his teachings have prescribed. Uh, and hopefully in our exchange, we'll get an opportunity to talk about and speak about those teachings. Um, I was so happy to hear, G, your reading the prayer for America, which was revealed by Abdul Baha, who is the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah. And that prayer holds a, a really a wonderful place in my heart. And in fact, uh, every opportunity we have, we try and share that prayer for America uh, with friends, colleagues, and those that we meet uh, in our work to promote race, excuse me, race amity. Uh, it is a prayer that I had the bounty of, uh, truly a bounty to present to Bill Clinton uh, in his office uh, some years ago when he was president of the United States. Uh, there was an event celebrating uh, the film, The Invisible Soldiers, Unheard Voices, and President Clinton had um, World War II, African American, Hispanic American, Asian American leaders uh, to his office as a part of the day of honor, saluting the contributions of African Americans and other minorities to World War II. And in that uh, ceremony, uh, in his office, uh, I had uh, prepared and brought with me uh, the prayer for America uh, re uh, revealed by Abdul Baha and had it nicely framed and, and uh, gave it to him as a part of our interchange. And for, uh, I was delighted, he set it on his desk. And so every time that there would be some television, anything that showed President Clinton in his office at his desk. The first thing I would do was look to see if the prayer was still there uh, on the corner of the desk. And, uh, and it was uh, actually, but uh, what a beautiful prayer that talks about the aspirations and addresses the aspirations uh, that we all seek for our country to unite the hearts, to be the symbol of the unity and the oneness of mankind. Uh, what I thought I would do tonight, uh, because I really want to address uh, what's in your hearts, uh, and I want to be careful not to just continue down a trail that's particularly in my mind, because quite honestly, my mission in being with you is to address and share as much as I can about Baha'u'llah, who again is the founder of the Baha'i faith and who gives inspiration to all of us who are Baha'is. And it is such a wonderful bounty to know of Baha'u'llah that one of the number one things in the hearts of Baha'is is to share the message of Baha'u'llah and encourage individuals who are not Baha'is to investigate the message. And so frankly, that's my mission and, and that's the basic mission of all of us who 
subscribe to the teachings of the Baha'i faith is to share it and to give others the opportunity to investigate the faith and to investigate the claim of Baha'u'llah, which is that he is the promised one of the ages and his principal mission and gift uh, of his revelation of his coming to humanity is to unite us into one human family. And the central teaching of the Baha'i faith, and it is the teaching around which all other teachings in our faith evolves. And that teaching is the unity and oneness of humanity. There are many teachings in the Baha'i faith that address all aspects of life. Uh, and I hope in our discussion to try and share in answering and discussing with you uh, those teachings as they pertain to what your concerns are as individuals. And we all have concerns. And I, Ajit asked me, well, what do you, what do you want to speak about, Smitty? Uh, and I said, what I want to speak about um, are the concerns of uh, societal conditions presently that you, that is those of you who are joining us this evening, that are on your minds and in your heart. And I want to know what are concerns that you have, particularly with the inability of political movements and faith movements to address the challenges that we face day in and day out. So as a part of my presentation, I really want to hear from you what's in your heart as pertains to the inability for the political process for faith movements to address the challenges that just constantly we're faced with day in and day out. And so uh, I'm going to invite you who are listening and who we can see uh, to express uh, what your concerns are. And I would like to the best of my ability to address those as they relate to the teachings of the Baha'i faith and of Baha'u'llah. Uh, I will say to you, those of you who are not Baha'i, that you will be given the opportunity to investigate. And this is a wonderful promise made by Baha'u'llah to all of humanity, that on whomever, whoever ears his name falls, Baha'u'llah, and the words Baha'i upon whoever ears that name falls, that individual will have the opportunity, the opportunity to investigate his cause and his claim. It does not say that the individual will become a Baha'i, but that the individual will have the opportunity to investigate this stupendous claim of Baha'u'llah, who is the glory of God, which those of you who aren't familiar, uh, that is the meaning of his title translated into English, Baha'u'llah, the glory of God. And if you are just hearing this for the first time, the name, you just might say it 
to yourselves, Baha'u'llah. Uh, but you will have the opportunity to investigate his claim to be the messenger of God for this day and the prescriptions and answers that he brings to all of humanity. And so before I start inviting your comments, I will just say that I had the extraordinary, extraordinary blessing of having the name Baha'i and Baha'u'llah fall upon my ears when I was just a small child, a boy. And I was, I grew up in a very religious Baptist family, long line of preachers, churchgoers, devout Christians, and at our Baptist church in South Carolina, when I was a little kid, five, six years old, uh, once a month, a white lady would come to our church. And of course, churches then were much like and even more so than they are now, segregated. So I grew up going to a black Baptist church. And once a month, a little white lady would come to our church and she would stand up during the recognition for visitors in my church. And she would say, my name is Junie Faley and I'm a member of the Baha'i faith. I am a follower of Baha'u'llah. And his teachings is that we are one human family. So I have come to worship with you this Sunday. And she would sit down. And she did that month after month like clockwork. She was to the point that actually my brothers and sisters and I, when we'd see her, we called it White Lady Sunday. There she is. And just the bounty of having Baha'u'llah's name and Baha'i fall on my ears as a small child. Years later, as a teenager, I had the opportunity to investigate the Baha'i faith and this claim and this person, Baha'u'llah. So having said that, I'm going to stop and I'm going to ask uh, those of you who are with us and thank you so much for coming out uh, and joining uh, this evening. Uh, but to ask you, um, what are the things in present day society uh, that you are concerned with relative to the inability of political movements and faith movements to address the horrendous challenges that we're faced with on all fronts in our society, in America, or in the world. So uh, whoever's controlling the speaking action, you can, uh, I invite you to uh, make your comment uh, about your concern. I would ask uh, respectfully that don't give speeches, but really address what concerns you have about the frailties and shortcomings in society relative to politics, relative to religion, uh, that things you see not being addressed as challenges that we face. 
I could add to Smitty's request, feel free to type your question into chat. We will read those to Dr. Smith. Um, but may I ask the first one? On a scale, if you were to look at America and all the challenges and problems we face as a nation, as a people, and our goal of attaining that perfect union. What is the biggest challenge? What is the biggest obstacle that we have to overcome, that we have to get past before we can start claiming that we are leading the world spiritually? Well, the most challenging issue uh, that we face in this nation uh, is the issue of race prejudice. It is the most complex and divisive aspect of our society, racial prejudice. It is the element that keeps us as a nation, a national community, from achieving our true potential, which incidentally is expressed uh, both in the Baha'i teachings and the philo ph philosophical uh, visions of the American founders. We all know that our national slogan or motto is E Pluribus Unum, of many one. And of course, as I've said, and all Baha'is gladly share the central principle and tenet of the Baha'i faith is the unity and oneness of the human family. And of course, as that pertains to us in America, that means our addressing and overcoming the prejudices and the issues that keep us apart. So the fundamental issue uh, that we have to address, Ajit, uh, is and the most challenging one is overcoming racial prejudice. Uh, and the, 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 the reason or well, one that is such a challenge is because it's such a deep seated issue in our society after the uh, decades and centuries of de attempts to dehumanize a significant significant portions of our society, both those people who were bought here in slavery from Africa, as well as those people who are native to this land who were assaulted uh, and abused over the centuries. And of course, both communities are still continue to be assaulted uh, and, and abused uh, and oppressed and treated unfairly. Uh, so the, the challenging, uh, the primary challenge uh, is to eliminate racial prejudice. Now there is a positive side to that. And that is, it's not that we're without instruction and it's not that we're without capacity. It is because we haven't looked at what our capacity has been and is and to commit and dedicate ourselves to addressing the issues that are before us and with us. But I need to amplify that a bit. Um, one of the things that we are all 
generally speaking, ignorant of. And that is the power of close association and loving friendships to abolish and overcome prejudice. In fact, the changes that we experience, and this is what actually the work that we're engaged in at the National Center for Race Amity, we examine and see how major changes and actions in social justice have developed as a result of close cross-racial, cross-cultural collaboration and friendship. Now, Abdul Baha, who I mentioned earlier, the son of the founder of the Baha'i faith, he came to America uh, in 1912. Uh, and Abdul Baha later asked Baha'is in America to address this issue of prejudice through creating a forum for people, Baha'is and their allies and friends to address the issue of this estrangement through creating friendship, opportunities for friendship. Abdul Baha, in fact, specifically asked Baha'is in Washington, D.C. at a very troubled time in our nation in 1921, which was right after the years of the Red Summer in 1919 and spilling over into 1920. And of course, uh, the horrific uh, atrocities that were being committed in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, but this period was the Red Summer and an extended aspect of the Red Summer of racial violence. And in an effort to address the deep wounds that were in this nation. Abdul Baha asked that there be a race amity conference, that people be brought together to address establishing and promoting friendship. Now there's a deep, deep wisdom in this. Uh, and the wisdom is that if you step back and just think about human relationships, the top tier of human relationships is family. We love our family. That's a very sacred and powerful relationship. The next most important and powerful relationship among human beings are friends. If you think personally about your friend, your best friend, and your friends, in some instances, we value friends at times more than we do family. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And we listen to friends in ways that we don't listen to others. I mean, personally, you know, if my younger brother and my older brother, who's now passed, but if they were to make address me in a critical way about something that I'm doing that they think is wrong, my response most likely is, "Hey, mind your own business, man. I can, I got this. You know, no, 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 you stay in your lane. You don't tell me about, but." If my best friend Bob makes that same criticism or suggestion, I listen in a totally different way. I'm open to it. 
because it's a different dynamic. The thing about friends is that that relationship is indissoluble. You can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. And when we develop friend relationships, they endure forever. People die for friends. And if you look at movements that deal with issues of social justice, people die in those movements for their loved friends and associates. So, so dealing with uh, racial prejudice, just circling back a G, dealing with racial prejudice is the most challenging issue and a way of overcoming that issue with a uh, long-term committed uh, uh, effort is to create friendships across racial and cultural lines. So I'm sorry if I went very long on answering that question or that comment. So I'll, I'll stop and see. I want to yeah. read you. I want to. I want to say something. For those of you that are watching on YouTube and wish to ask Dr. Smith a question, my phone number is 281-788-0380. Feel free to text me your question and I will read it out to Dr. Smith. Um, Smitty, there's a comment from uh, Ayana. She says, I feel like the either or fallacy is prevalent in American politics today. Either you're on this side or you're on that other side. And you have to keep that position on everything, no matter what. In reality, everything is complex. And sometimes we disagree with each other, even with people that we actually agree with. The faith helps us step away from this, not permitting us to engage in partisan politics and by encouraging routine consultation. Uh, so her comment is about people engaging in partisan politics and arguing with each other. Well, the, that concern, uh, and only as, uh, and let me just say this, uh, it may or may not be acceptable, uh, but I believe it to be true uh, that uh, revelators, messengers of God are divine and that in their divinity uh, and all knowingness that they have prescriptions and knowledge for treating and dealing with the issues that humans engage that we as human beings engage uh, in our lives and in, in our communities and in our society. Uh, one of the uh, things that is addressed in the teachings of Baha'u'llah uh, is summed up in uh, a quote that I will actually paraphrase, but is that uh, we should avoid partisan politics like the plague. That's, it's a powerful notion. We know that the plague is deadly, debilitating, um, and that it really distracts from our health and vitality. But if we drill down and examine that thought more closely, and we look at the structure uh, of politics and the way the political process operates. It's essentially at heart an alienating process. That is, the process pits people against one another. Even in what we call a democratic process, essentially, in putting it in simple terms, that in a basic political process, even in a class 
with kids, not even going into Democrat and Republican or independents or whatever political stripe people may claim to have. But let's just take a simple process of an election in a middle school for a president of the homeroom class. <laughs> I nominate a G. Okay. And Puran, uh, she nominates Nabil. Well, the minute Puran nominates Nabil, we know she's not for a G. So there's an alienation process there. And you can believe me, when Ajit hears Puran nominate Nabil, if Ajit wins as president of our seventh grade classroom, he's not going to be doing Puran any favors. Right? It's alienate. She's not his friend. You know? And so there is a division automatically. Now, here is a process, and I'm just using it as an example about the ability of the messenger of God to address that kind of issue. In the Baha'i community, we have elections and people are elected to serve on local bodies called local spiritual assemblies. They're also elected on the national level to serve on the National Spiritual Assembly. And in fact, for years, Ajit and Puran and I would at least see each other once a year because we were had the bounty of having been elected as a delegate to go to the National Convention uh, in, in Wilmette, Illinois. But at any rate, the process though of being elected is a process that's outlined in the Baha'i teachings that emanate from Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. That is, the electoral process is one person, one vote, no nominating, no campaigning, secret ballot based on prayer and meditation by the individual voting. So when we get ready to elect in the seventh grade, the class president, and if we engage in a process where each of us in the classroom meditate on, well, who's the person who best serves the interest and who's a good person? And we think would really do a good job. And then we secretly write that name down. It's not revealed to everybody else. So Ajit doesn't know whether I voted for him or not. And Nabil doesn't know whether Puran voted for him or not. So first of all, the whole alienation process is eliminated, which is a divisive process between people. Secondly, if he, Ajit wins, right? He doesn't know who voted for him. So he can't reach over and give Smitty a pat on the back and add a boy and say, okay, Smitty, you're going to be my second in charge because you voted for me. He doesn't know who voted for him. But I'm oversimplifying it, friends. But the idea is that the alienation of individuals need to be taken out of the political process. And instead, we should rely on individual conscience and individual choice. And we get the results of not only electing someone who is responsible and the person receiving the most votes, but we have avoided that whole alienation. So in terms of the political process, there need be tremendous adjustments. And I do believe that that will happen because 
when you explain this process to most people, I haven't heard anybody ever say, that's a horrible process. I'd rather have a process where people call each other names and that people do all of these other things that they do in politics. Almost, I've never heard anybody react that way. What I have heard is that people nod and say, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so uh, this is a way in which the revelation, the teachings of Baha'u'llah and the Baha'i faith address a common day problem of tremendous dissension. Uh, and after you know the racial issue, politics is a close second in terms of divisions and alienation. And incidentally, much of politics is tied in to race prejudice too. So we don't, we can't separate those two things out. So, yeah. but I'll, I'll stop there, sorry. I have always thought to the notion of saying, please vote for me because I'm so great and the other guy or the woman is a bum, just goes against the notion of my faith and every other faith notion of humility. I'm great, the other guy is not. Just to say that bothers me. Uh, there's a question from Sue Emel from New York. Uh, she says, how could Christians justify segregating in their churches? How might white churches respond if black people were to offer to speak to them today? Is it being done? How did they justify, churches justify segregation in the name of Jesus? Well, I don't know how they justify it. Uh, <laughs> I think what happens is, uh, you know, people bury, bury their own uh, prejudices uh, within their belief communities. Uh, and I, I would say that it's not only um, within the issue of race within churches, uh, but it's within the issue of uh, certain um, artificial, superficial traditions that have been baked into various faiths and religions and particularly into churches over the years. In other words, left to their own devices, people have come up with little embellishments. Uh, if you were to strip down the teachings of His Holiness Jesus Christ to their bare level, you find actually they're the same as the teachings of Baha'u'llah if you were to strip down to their basic element, the teachings of Muhammad, you will find that they're the same as the teachings of Baha'u'llah. If you break down the teachings of the great revelators in the past, of the past, you'll find that they are the same. And this, of course, leads to the pronouncement and the teaching of Baha'u'llah that religion is one. That is the same spirit that emanated from Muhammad is the same spirit that emanated from Christ, from Buddha, from Baha'u'llah. And God and his wisdom, of course, because of our lack of capacity, only can reveal and has revealed 
so much to us as human beings that we could understand. So, of course, the teachings of Baha'u'llah, Christ could have taught what Baha'u'llah taught, but people couldn't understand it. How could you be talking about the oneness of humanity and world unity when people were walking around thinking the earth was flat? You know what I mean? Like, that just was something we couldn't get our heads around. Of course, Baha'u'llah, in this age, we've grown as human beings in our sophistication, knowledge, and learning that there's so many teachings that uh, he shares with us today that previous ages, people could not understand. In fact, Jesus said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will teach you all things. I mean, hey, you guys are dummies, you know. <laughs> you can't get this right now. But I'll be back. <laughs> or someone will come to teach you these things. And, of course, I'm sort of uh, putting a little jest into it. But essentially, that it has to do with our capacity. And it's the same uh, in the teachings of His Holiness Christ who says, uh, I have many sheep that are not of this fold. And he speaks of the day of the coming of the one fold and the one shepherd. And of course, those sheep of the folds are Muslims, are Jews, are Buddhists. And of course, Baha'u'llah in this age brings his teaching to us that we're one human family. He brings the teaching that there's one God, that there's one religion, that there's one human family. So um, the division of within churches and people rejecting uh, people because of their color, uh, or their cultural origin uh, or things that are baked in because people uh, have really strayed away from the fundamental teachings of their religious faith. I mean, uh, there's a, this Christian uh, gentleman, minister, uh, and I can't remember actually if he was a, a minister or just a lay person. But he did this wonderful thing uh, to demonstrate the power of the teachings of Christ relative to people who, well, in this particular instance, the relationship of black people and white people in this country. And what he did was he called this, this kid up out of an audience and uh, had the kid come. And the kid was nervous. So this was not a prefabricated thing. This black kid who's a teenager like, oh, heck, what's, gonna, what's happening? And so the guy says, genuinely and seriously from his heart, and you knew he was sincere, he said, one of the things that Jesus did to express his love for his fellow man and to exemplify his love is that he humbled himself to wash the feet of one of the followers, one of his people. And he says, what I want to demonstrate is that love of Christ. I want to wash your feet. And this guy literally got down on his knees. It was, it was, it touched my heart. It made me cry. 
he washed this young boy's feet. And he said, I'm doing this to let you know and to try and manifest the love of Jesus in my heart for you as a fellow human being. And he turned and he said, all of you as Christians, I challenge you to seek this in your relationship with people who are of a different race or different color. I mean, man, what a beautiful wow. thing. So anyway, um, that's, uh, that's how white people might respond. I mean, the question was, <laughs> how might white people respond to black people? They can do as Jesus did if they are acting in the name of his holiness Christ. Dr. Smith, is it okay if I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> so I, um, you know, this, um, the war conflict that's going on right now uh, in the Ukraine, um, you know, we're, we're thinking about systems that are failing us and everything. Um, I, I had shared with my, sort of my apartment community, we have sort of this, group there's like 120 folks on there and you know I, I shared the quote from from Baha'u'llah about um you know it's not for him to pride himself who loveth his own country but rather for him who loveth the whole world and the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens well that it's a, it's a pretty well-known quote right but the part that precedes that in the paragraph and I put that and then later I, I added this as well to them but it talks about the time you know he talks about the time must come when uh, the imperative necessity for the holding of a vast and all-embracing assemblage of men will be universally realized. The rulers and kings of the earth must needs attend it, and participating in its deliberations must consider such ways and means as will lay the foundations of the world's great peace amongst men. And the last part of it, he says, should any king take up arms against another, all should unitedly arise and prevent him. And of course, you know, there's the, the reactions to it were, well, that's, you know, beautiful. And I had to put it in context. This was even before the League of Nations was established, right? That, that these words were spoken. And so people thought it was beautiful, but at the same time, it was acknowledged that we have fallen short. We're still not there. Um, and, and not just because of the Ukraine. I mean, you know, perhaps a lot of attention is now on this particular conflict, but these conflicts happen around the world. And, and this one happens to have a lot of attention, but um, we're still not quite there yet. We're trying, uh, but we're not quite there yet. I was wondering your opinion on that. Well, I mean, I agree we're not quite there yet. Uh, but I think that uh, tragically, and on trying to look at the upside, we're moving. In the, in the direction of getting there. And I think it's all so complex and intertwined, but I think we're getting there because, you know, people, the Ukrainians, there are people quite frankly in other places and countries that have suffered much greater atrocities than what the Ukrainians are suffering today. But by, they've been generally ignored. And those atrocities, I mean, literally, the things that happened in Rwanda, man, huh, you know, they weren't bombing buildings, they were chopping off people's heads. Dad, is so Hale ready to respond yet? To I'm you? sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, um, that's my son. Please keep going. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, so, but here's the interesting piece of this. 
and it ties into all of the complexities of race, culture, and all these other issues. So now, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of other people have been massacred recently. Uh, so now the Ukrainians through the barbaric uh, warped uh, motivations of Putin are now coming under attack and you know being killed and so forth. How the people who are becoming under attack look like the majority of people who are in control of economies and nations in terms of power in the world. Essentially, they're white people. And there is a easy identity and affiliation immediately with those people. I mean, when you see the thing on the news where the Russian soldiers are getting confused because they're saying, dang, these people are just like us. They never even speak like us. You know, so now the repulsion and rejection of this unprovoked violence that's being perpetrated by Putin on these people uh, is widely embraced in the Eurocentric world, as it should be. So don't misunderstand, I am not in any way low rating what this response and situation should be. But by the act of that happening, it's having an impact in the leadership and the power cauldrons of the world. Because essentially now, nations of Euro descent or the power nations of the world. And so as we address these atrocities, we are eliminating and addressing an issue that has ramifications everywhere. And we're advancing because I do believe, and this is just obviously my belief, like anybody else has a guess, that uh, this is not going to end well for Putin. It is not going to end well for him. And it's going to be a step in moving toward that lesser peace that's implied about nations coming together and preventing these atrocities so that the next time this starts to happen, not in Europe, but maybe in a South American country, I'm just picking whatever it might be. The precedent is there for people to ban together nations, nations as they are doing now to put us under the aggressor. And in mm -hmm. this case, that's what's happening yeah. in the world because there are only five countries that are not condemning Russia, only five. And of course, they are all led by people like-minded to Putin. Yeah. So, I so see hopefully this is raising the standard. It's right. It's, it's an advance, but it's how it's happening. And because of the context of where it's happening mm -hmm. and who it's happening to, that it gives greater empathy. You know, it's like, I can walk along and if it ain't happening to me or somebody who I know or feel affiliated with, 
Mm. I'm not so interested <laughs> or as interested when it's happening to somebody who's just like me. Then I got a new take on this and it expands my capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my, and that could, that's just a personal opinion. That's my thought. Friends, in introducing Smitty, I forgot to mention something that. Smitty served in the U.S. Army as a medic in Vietnam, where he was awarded two Bronze Star and a Combat Medic Badge. And I always feel that no one knows the horrors of war more than someone who's gotten shot at in a war. So I just, <laughs> just <laughs> truly say no one knows the horrors as much as someone who was actually in a war. And, and so... I, Smitty it's, still it's so works. true. Yeah? Yeah, war literally brings out the bestiality in human beings. Mm -hmm. It truly, truly does. Uh, People become inhuman in war. I met with a friend last week in Smitty. You know him, Jack uh, McCants, in uh, yeah. Houston. And he was talking about his Korea experience. And he says after so many years, he still has nightmare about Korea. Yeah. So, war is tough, war is, is tough. tough. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, will we get involved with the war, Smitty? Do you think, does America need to be involved with the war as the world's leader? No, I don't think, uh, I don't think we will. Uh, I hope that we won't, quite frankly, in terms of why you say involved, you mean putting bodies into the fray. Mm -hmm. um, I think, and it's actually in a sad, sad way, uh, the nations who are combating uh, Putin's actions, they have put their finger on something and that is, it's about the money. It's about the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it is about the money. And I think um, as a, this, you know, tighten the uh, oligarchs, Material possessions, Putin's material possessions, that that's going to have an impact. But I also think that uh, there is a response. Um, I, I was touched so much by that grandmother, and you all saw it, the Ukrainian woman who went up to the Russian soldier and gave him seeds and says, you are here now brutalizing us, but these seeds will grow when you're gone. Mm. Mm. Um, and this kid, and then she gave the kid a cell phone to call his mother. I mean, mm. see, there's just there's so many variables. That are just acting out and we don't know. I don't know. I have, I don't have any, all I do is I'm mm. just praying that, you know, <laughs> as we all are that. What's that song you go, when will this ever, when will we ever learn? When will we ever learn? So, so all we can do is play, pray with all of you. Smitty, you have a wonderful program going called Race Amity. And while it's working wonderfully well in your neck of the woods, how do we, A, extend that program to Houston, Austin, Dallas. Uh, 
you know, we we would like to be as Baha'is here, the voice for race unity, the voice for race unity. How can we become that? And B, most importantly, you, you want to come to Austin, visit us and tell us how to do it? <laughs> well, no, you can come to us, uh, meaning uh, the staff at uh, the National Center for Race Amity. We just had a uh, workshop and we have one or two each year where people, and at the last one, there were people from 48 cities, 46 cities who, were, who attended the workshop. And the workshop was on how to plan and organize Race Amity Day events and activities in your community and how to do it at the state level and to advance as a number of states have done and it's grown beyond Massachusetts now that Maryland, Alabama, <laughs> Alabama, have oh, proclaimed man. the second Sunday in June as Race Hammer today. But there are workshops that the center holds, and they'll be holding another one shortly. And the reason uh, they just held one, what, what is it? It's March now, right? They held one in February and they held one in November where people, you just sign up, sign on, say, I want to attend the Race Amity planning workshop. And they do them on Saturday. And it's about a 90 minute to two hour workshop session. And there are people literally uh, allies of Race Amity from around the country. And these are people who've done it and who do it, who offer presentations about how they went about the business of organizing effective and widely embraced Race Amity Day activities in their communities. Now, the thing is for everybody, this there's something that's, uh, there's a power in morality. There's an exponential power in morality, in fact. The numbers are not the important thing. It is the commitment and the righteousness of the cause in which we're engaged. And this is testimony, testimony borne out in all great movements, whether they're religious movements like the Baha'i faith, you know, that started and was brutally, brutally crushed in its opening years. And is now a world religion that's influencing, really influencing people around the world to make change. But just a small, small number of people, of course, that was divine in aspiration and in inspiration. But you take smaller movements. The abolitionist movement in America was a tiny movement. The civil rights movement in this country was a tiny movement. I mean, only a minuscule number, and this is in our lifetimes, only a minuscule percentage of Americans were actively engaged in the civil rights movement. I mean, of course, now everybody, <laughs> you know, there's a joke in, in the, in the uh, civil rights community at large that, you know, if everybody who says they were at the march on Selma were actually at Selma, the bridge would have collapsed, you know? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But I mean, everybody, you know, but if you look at Dr. King 
and you look at the civil rights movement, it was just a tiny, tiny, a fraction of 1% of the American population actively engaged in civil rights. But morality has an exponential power to change things. Mm -hmm. It's true with the Hispanic movement. United Farm Workers, to Louis Wharton, Cesar Chavez, and that whole crew, they were minuscule, many, minuscule. But the things that that movement bore to advance the rights of Latina communities and farm workers affected millions of people. So we know we have the exponential power of morality in our hands. So as we're trying to do this work in these little workshops all over the, for these communities, know that you will have that power and you have that power. And so uh, one of the ways it's manifest we just recently, I had a, I did a presentation at the national convention. This was two weeks ago of the franchise owners for Ben and Jerry's uh, ice cream, um, you know, company. And so Ben and Jerry's franchise, the, the corporate community, they're interested and want to, and will be working with communities across America who are interested in doing race Amity Day work. And that started because one little Ben and Jerry's guy up here in Boston started supporting the race Amity Day event on the Boston Common each year in Massachusetts. And uh, he started by, first year he brought his truck out and he sold ice cream because it was a good market. It's in June. And he was selling ice cream right and left. But then he said, wow, this is such a great cause. Next year I'm gonna bring the truck, but I'm gonna give the ice cream away. Well, of course, that balloon, the last one we had before the pandemic, there were over 5,000 people who came out to the Rose Kennedy Greenway for the race Amity Day thing. But he shared with other Ben and Jerry's guys, some of his friends down in Atlanta. And so they said, oh, wow, we want to start getting involved. Long story short, it evolved into now, uh, they are formally setting up a thing where they will, in communities where they have Ben and Jerry's and the franchise owners, are interested, and not all are, but many will be, they will be reaching out and working with local activities to support them, whether it's giving away ice cream or just sending their staff out to help do work or whatever it is. Uh, but that's the sort of the moral power uh, of what the venture is uh, in Unleashed by Abdul Baha. Incidentally, I want to say one thing. Please, if you, if you haven't seen the short documentary, Roots of the Race Amity Movement, go on YouTube and see it. It's a 16 minute documentary, but uh, please do that and share it, pass it along. Roots of the Race Amity Movement. And it's on YouTube. It was produced by the National Center, but um, it's on YouTube. I'm sorry. Yeah, Nabil Yazdani brings up a question that is of great personal interest to me. Uh, and by way of background, we do an annual Lewis Gregory Symposium here 
on the campus of Houston Tillerson. Paul. Yeah. Every year, and we have a fairly uh, excellent event that goes from one to five in the afternoon. And this year is scheduled for the 22nd of April. Uh, and he asked the question, I wonder if our Lewis, local Lewis Gregory Symposium could contact and learn from the National Race Unity Committee, uh, Race, Race Amity Committee, I guess he meant. Excellent no idea. And since I serve on the board of Lewis Gregory Symposium, perfect for me to bring up as a subject for a discussion. Absolutely. This is just right on point. Mm -hmm. Right on point. Thank you. Uh, other questions, comments? Anyone else wants to say something either on YouTube or Zoom? I will tell you, this has been a wonderful, enlightening presentation, Smitty. Um, it really has been. And I'm super glad you brought up Jane Faley at the beginning. Uh, really a wonderful woman. She, she uh, threw some things, you know, connected. But I met her in person uh, a few years ago when she came to Houston for her cancer treatment. I had known of her, about her, and through other sources. Uh, but I had never actually met her, and that was the only time I actually got to meet her. So what a wonderful woman, what a great yes. servant of the faith. Yeah. But a, I, it, and this brings us to something that we should all think about, start going to churches on Sundays. Go to church on Sunday, just sit there in the pew, they'll, they'll introduce you. I know the last time I was, I was at a synagogue here in Austin, uh, and, and the rabbi stopped in the middle of his thing on a Saturday morning and introduced me as member of the Baha'i community of Austin. And I think that's a wonderful thing for us all to try to do. Any other thoughts, questions before I thank Smitty for his presentation? Um, for those of you that don't know this, um, Nabil Yazdani has recorded this on YouTube. There is a YouTube link to this presentation and uh, it will go online and everybody else will be able to watch it. All of you are able to access that YouTube link and share it with friends and family that were actually unable to make it today. Um, you had a tough gig, uh, Smitty, because this was in the middle of the fast. And some of some of the people in our community are very young and they still need to fast. So <laughs> the advantages of aging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, if, I, if I could, Ajit, read two comments that were uh, just posted on YouTube. Um, uh, Sue Emil said, thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, for your excellent example um, of the qualitative difference between partisan politics and the Baha'i electoral process. And Farooz Masrur said, what an amazing talk, Dr. Smith, uplifting and inspiring. Thanks very much to the friends who organized these events. So thank you. My dear brother, thank you very much. There, really, I, I am so delighted that you agreed to do this. And um, I have a set of 12 speakers that come in once a year. Uh, so think about March, 2023, when you'll be doing this again, Smitty. <laughs> really, really, okay. thank you. Thank you very well, much. And I will send a link of this to Bob tonight. Well, I want to thank you, my brother, for inviting me. I really do. One of my greatest, greatest honors and privilege is to be allowed to talk about the Lord of the age. I'm blessed to be able to 
have you invite me to do that. And thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all. I thank you all for attending. Um, I, I, will, I will send you email later, Smitty, but thank you in very, very much. There are not enough words to thank you. And, and I, will, I will invite you to the future events. Just a reminder, dear friends, that our speaker for April 1 is Bobby Ahdiek, the child that Smitty. Him, yeah. <laughs> Guess what? I tell him Uncle Smitty was here before him. <laughs> yeah, he knows that. He knows oh, he, that. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I have asked my daughter, Rachel, to introduce him. Um, she knows him well and they're fellow lawyers. And then I said, and her husband, Rachel's husband is a Texas A&M grad. So I figured this would be perfect. So she, I guess, agreed to introduce him. So in any case, thank you all very much. Good night. I really appreciate it. I will send flyers for the next event. Please 